Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth in a series of webinars in the This is America series hosted by the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. This series explores how American social, political, and economic systems are rooted and invested in anti-Black racism. My name is Elena Shi. I'm an assistant professor of American studies at Brown and a faculty fellow at the CSSJ where I direct a human trafficking research cluster. Our amazing group of panelists today are joining us to talk about their organizing experiences around ending police and different forms of state-sponsored violence in Rhode Island. Following the police killings and targeting of Black Americans this past summer and for decades, rallying cries to defund the police have reached an all-time high, but this slogan takes on really drastically different political and organizing meanings situated somewhere in between a politics of complete abolition and one of redistribution of resources. Our panelists today highlight the organizing strategies of three different providence-based efforts to abolish and redistribute police power. We'll start with a discussion of the 2017 Community Safety Act, then move to the inspiring youth-led Counselors Not Cops campaign, and finally end with efforts to abolish ICE presence at the Wyatt Correctional Facility. I'll introduce each panelist before they speak. They'll deliver their comments, and then we really, really look forward to a vibrant and robust Q&A with all of you who have joined us this afternoon. So without ado, it is my great honor to introduce our first panelist, Vanessa Flores Maldonado, she, her, is a queer Guatemalan woman born and raised in Los Angeles. Growing up in working class, non-English speaking immigrant community meant learning at too young of an age the violence and trauma of the criminal justice system in this country. It wasn't until she moved to Providence to attend Brown University in which Vanessa could understand how white supremacy is fueled by capitalism and state violence at the expense of I just look at this color. at the screen. Why are you that you? <laughs> like the ones that raised her. A significant factor in developing her organizing and political analysis was meeting the Providence Youth Student Movement, a grassroots organization that centers black and brown, queer and trans youth, and survivors of state violence in building a world without police, prisons, or borders. Vanessa first became involved with PRISM as part of the queer trans programming before she was hired to coordinate the Community Safety Act campaign, which she'll tell us about today. January 2020 marks a significant time for Vanessa as she transitioned to become PRISM's co-executive director with Stephen Dye as her other half. Thanks so much, Vanessa, for joining us. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, there's a lot going on in my office. Um, we have community members coming by to pick up their farm shares. Um, and so there's just, there's a dog in here, there are babies, there's family and friends, per usual in the prison office. Um, but everybody's wearing their mask, don't worry. Hand sanitizer everywhere, six feet apart. Um, but thank you for that introduction. Hi, <laughs> um, yes. Um, so talking about the Community Safety Act, is something that for me is just it's a beautiful wonderful um example of like what community power is right so the community safety act started off as this statewide initiative um that was uh that included Pr prism providence Youth Student movement dare direct action for rights and equality included statewide allies and included statewide organizations um, because we were aiming to, uh, to affect at a statewide level. Unfortunately, it got co-opted, right? And this is what happens when you have allies that do too much, when you have um, community power being uh, taken away and having closed meetings. And so community members decided, you know what, we're, we don't want something that no longer truly comes from us. So we're going to focus on a citywide uh, community safety ordinance, right? And so that history for me is really important because one, I feel like we don't talk about that enough, right? The origins of where community power comes from. But two, also shows a perfect example of 
again, what happens if you have white allies who, instead of actually organizing with community, start just taking over community. Um, and so yeah, so it became a um, citywide effort uh, led by PRISM, by DARE, by American Friends Service Committee, Southern New England chapter, and by the Only Vale Neighborhood Association. So these four organizations that are at the grassroots level that address different issues that ultimately impact the same people over and over again, decided that they wanted to focus their efforts on an ordinance that really creates transparency, transparency and accountability within the Providence Police Department, right? And so this is a, a citywide ordinance that took five years to pass and is really time and time again, um, there are news articles and videos and audios and just so much a documented history that's really beautiful that I encourage y'all to watch because you'll see over and over again, you have youth of color, you have elders, you have queer and trans um, people of color just showing up over and over again at city hall, at um, community meetings, at community uh, events and celebrations demanding uh, the end of police violence. And so I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty because again, there's just so much beautiful history that uh, you can find if you Google Providence Community Safety Act. But I do wanna talk about one thing about how this uh, ordinance this campaign was about, um, about community power. Also, Elena, can you, is there like a time check thing? Yeah, I'll can tell you, I'll, you have 15 minutes. I'll let you know when you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just realized I was like going on and on. Um, but so with the Community Safety Act, you had, um, right, really community be centered in this. And so we had meetings um, every week. We had with each other as a coalition to talk about what is it that we want to see in this ordinance, right? And there are so many sections in this ordinance that are specifically tied to the lived experiences of community members in Providence, right? And so when we're talking about creating an impact in a city, no matter what the city is, right, you have to be sure that you're specific to what those city, to that community, to what the folks there really want, right? I say this because we've had um, other cities and other towns really um, tr like contacting us and being like, hey, like, can we talk about, you know, what, how, how y'all went about this ordinance and getting it passed? And then we'll be talking and talking and then we'll find out, oh wait, there's completely different uh, policing that's happening here, right? Um, I think it, it was like Idaho or so, I forgot where, what state, what town it was, but it was like in the Midwest essentially. And they were talking a lot around pepper spray and um, what was it? It was, um, what? What is that thing called? Taser guns, thank you, taser guns. Um, and they were talking about that and that was not something that we were talking about or referencing in the Community Safety Act because that wasn't something that our, our community members were um, seeing happen to them. And so it's important when we're trying to create change on a local level that we're really, really focused and tuned to what's happening to that community, right? We're seeing across the nation this community, um, this conversation around defunding the police and abolishing the police, right? But abolishing police and defunding police in LA, where I'm from, is incredibly different than defunding and abolishing the police here in Providence, where it's now my home. Um, and so I want to make sure that, you know, as we have these conversations, we are very specific to what's happening here in Providence, right? So you do have neighborhoods here that are very much segregated, You've got the West End, you've got the South Side where you're seeing a lot more police presence than you do in, for example, the East Side where I used to live, um, slash am living in. Um, housing also is another issue we gotta talk about at some point. So you have policing happening very differently in these neighborhoods, right? Police in the East Side, they're worried about stolen packages and you know their Amazon boxes getting, getting robbed from their porches and their plants, you know, the petunias. Communities in the West and in the South Side, literally two, was that last night or, when was that? Was that Sunday? Mm -hmm. It was last night, where you had 50 police officers, Providence Police Department officers, swarming the entire West End, swarming Dexter Park. 
with 50 other state troopers swarming that area, right? Because people were protesting um, because of America once again showing that Black lives in fact do not matter with the Breonna Taylor uh, grand jury decision. So you have protesters in the West End in Dexter Park and the response is a hundred cop cars all around and folks terrified and not knowing what is going on, what is happening, right? So the fact that we had back in, in 2014, 2015, when we were working on this, passing on, pass, trying to um, pass this ordinance, we knew that, you know, what, what is happening right now, we knew that, we've been knowing that because that's been our lived experiences, right? We know what it's like to have our house be raided by ICE. We know what it's like to fear uh, death and abuse and violence and harm from police officers, right? And so we wanted to make this ordinance something that will help protect as many of us as possible, but also try to find ways to create transparency within the police department, right? What happened uh, on Sunday with the police swarming, we don't know why that happened. We don't know what, who made that call, why that call was made. We don't, there's not much information out there, right? And this is something that communities who have been suffering under the Providence uh, game database, they know what that's like. Because for a while in Providence, there was a game database, but what, what, does that, what does that mean? How do you get on this game database? What does it mean to be a gang member, right? These were questions that community members had that nobody was answering or giving answers that even made sense. Um, and so one of the things that we did with the CSA was create transparency, create, why are you putting people on gang databases? What is the criteria that you're using for this? Because you cannot use race. That's something that has affected community members a lot, but the assumption that just because you're Kamai, just because you live in the West End, just because you, this is your cousin, you are a gang member. We have heard this story so many times from our youth. And so what we're trying to do with this ordinance, whew, it's a lot, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, but what we're trying to do with this ordinance is make it so that community can get some answers, can, create, can get some form of, of answers to all of these questions that they have as, as to why is this happening to us? Why is it that still, we passed this amazing ordinance, right? The community did back in 2017. It was implemented uh, in 2018. And we're still not seeing changes in the police department in the ways that we were trying to, trying to see happen. And why is it that we're not seeing, we're seeing a more visible intimidation tactics happening to our community members, right? We took power back with the passage of the Community Safety Act. We created the Providence External Review Authority to review cases of, mis of police misconduct. Although I do want to note that um, civilian oversight boards are considered a form of reform and not true abolition, right? Providence Youth Student Movement is an abolitionist organization. We do not believe in reform. We do not believe that reform will actually give our community the needed safety, wellness, and overall power. So we are demanding for complete abolishment through the defunding of the police. With the CSA, there were aspects of it that were reform, right? Because at that time, the community conversation was incredibly different. Back in 2017, we were still having the discussion of all lives versus Black Lives Matter, right? We were still having internal dialogues about what does it mean to, to say Black Lives Matter? What does it mean to abolish the police? Back then, the conversation was very different to what it is now. And it's reflected in not just the way in which everyone is very proudly saying Black Lives Matter in their storefront windows, but also in the way that some of these politicians are moving, right? The CSA, because of its nature, we did have to engage with politicians a lot. So specifically city councils, you had to get, because it's an ordinance, you had to get city council approval. Um, and we can talk about that and how like complicated that was and it was an ordeal, but we had to interact with a lot of these politicians that really were not, not anywhere close to where they are now. Now you have politicians saying, I pledge to defund the police, um, or I pledge to pass a, a city budget, my bad, uh, that defunds the police. 
back in 2017, back in 2015, we had city council members who were just such a pain to talk to. And some of them, you know, granted are still on city council, Joanne Ryan, but wow, city council has really changed a lot. And the way that we defund police has changed a lot, right? The way that we take back community power has changed a lot because now the conversation isn't all lives versus black lives. Now the conversation is defund the police, but how do we do that? And so the Community Safety Act was powerful for what it, for what it was, and, and to some aspects still is, right? We still have methods in which we can make, we can track data, which is information, because unfortunately, which is important, because unfortunately, data is one of the ways that politicians like to engage with community. It's messed up. It's really messed up, but they like it when you present them shiny reports and figures and numbers. So with the Community Safety Act, we're able to get some of those uh, figures and reports and numbers to show, actually, there is a problem of policing in Providence. No, our police officers are not shooting people fatally, and that's a key word there, but our police officers are still causing a lot of harm in our communities, right? Um, and so we have to think about ways in which we're undoing a lot of these uh, conversations around, you know, we still have to, to have to undo these like bad apples versus good apples thing, but we also have to expand the conversation a little bit, and I know my time is almost up, um, to include not just abolishing police, but abolishing policing and punishment also, because that looks very, very different um, as time goes on. So, yes, thank you for that. Thanks so much, Vanessa, for sharing your experiences. And in particular, we wanted to start off with the CSA because it was passed in 2017, but of course with organizing starting far earlier than that. And so some of Vanessa's comments have situated this particular moment that we're in now with a longer history of what anti-Black racism has met and what some of its um, responses have looked like and how those have changed over the years. So next chronologically, we're gonna to shift to the counselors, not cops campaign. And as speakers are talking, I encourage everybody to use the Q&A function. We'll moderate a discussion at the end, but as questions come up, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, but join me in welcoming Simone Burrell and Jason Rodriguez. Simone is 20 years old and has worked at the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians for Education, or ARISE, since she was 16. There, she was a lead organizer and helped run the Youth Leader Program, where they serve nearly 10 youth a year in each cohort. Through this program, she also participated in the founding organizing of the Counselors Not Cops campaign through the PATH Coalition, and that stands for the Providence Alliance for Student Safety. Simone graduated from Times Two Academy. Equally, join me in welcoming Jason Rodriguez, a senior at the Met High School, born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island. He is the leadership team co-director at the Providence Student Union, where Jason works closely with the team of Providence High School students on education policy campaigns, recruitment, and decision making for the organization. Alongside his education policy organizing work, Jason is an incoming research intern at Direct Action for Rights and Equality, DARE, um, and also at the CSSJ, which we did not know when we invited Jason to be on this panel. Please welcome Jason and Simone, who will share their experiences with the Counselors Not Cops campaign, which seeks to remove all school resource officers from Providence Public Schools and replace them with more mental and physical health support for students. Hi everyone. So I'm Simone. I'm going to be speaking with Jason on this and we're kind of going to go on and off, um, basically talking about past, talking about counselors, not cops, the demands that we have, um, and then the history behind it. So Jason, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I can start with okay. that. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, again, uh, I'm Jason and I've been with the Counselors Not Cops campaign slash Promise Union since 
my freshman year of high school, I started out doing some um, organizing work around our Student Bill of Rights campaign, which is um, a campaign that focuses on uh, our Student Bill of Rights, which has 22 articles demanding and stating rights that students should have in Providence Public Schools, um, that they are not, you know, guaranteed or um, fully have the access to or the rights to in their schools. Um, and so I was around the time like advocating for um, student identity and um, for students to have the right to express their identity freely and um, have uh, administrative support from um, for that as well. And so around that same time, that's when I joined um, the Counselors Not Cops campaign, which was actually um, sort of at the time being coordinated by Aureli. And I was able to work um, in collecting survey data around policing in schools. And so asking students how they personally felt about having police in their schools, if they felt safe, um, what supports they actually needed, um, and how they felt if they did have police in, police, police in schools, and like, if so, like how many they had. Um, and so yeah, like originally the campaign began in 2017 at PSU by public pu province, public school students across Rhode Island, um, and it's still an ongoing campaign. Um, the, the campaign eventually became one of the main focuses for the PASS coalition with other organizations and PASS stands for the Providence Alliance for Student Safety and other organizations that are part of it now are um, Arise, PRISM, uh, Riddle, which is the Rhode Island, Rhode Island Urban Debate League, um, Youth in Action, um, and Young Voices. And so it's just a big coalition of um, youth orgs that are advocating for um, counselors not cops at the moment. Um, and to be very clear and upfront at the beginning, um, our demands are to remove all school resource officers from Providence Public Schools, hire health and, sa and safety staff focus on alternative measures for conflict resolution, and increase the number of support staff in schools overall. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, so once again, um, my name is Simone. Thank you for that, Jason. Basically, I'm going to break down how I got into CNC. So like Jason said, it started in 2017. At the time at Arise, I was actually one of the youth leaders in the youth leader program. I didn't quite um, facilitate it yet. I didn't run the program yet. But when I was a youth, we did come together with PSU and PRISM at the time. It was just us three for a while. And we worked on counselors, not cops together. Um, so a little history. I'm not going to dive into the history of um, policing in America, because that goes way back to slavery. So we're just going to go to policing in schools. So that happened around the late um, 1930s, early 1940s. And at the time, um, it was basically just um, Indianapolis Public School, which hired a special investigator to serve the school in 1930. And then when integration started happening in the schools, um, a few yeah, a few years later when integration started happening, black students were going to school with white students. And then, you know, the white folks didn't quite like that. So uh, they hired police officers to just to patrol around the schools, not necessarily being inside of it, but to patrol it. Um, so we can obviously see who they were protecting at that time. But then that also goes into what's happening now. So uh, the official school resource officer didn't come into play until 1950 in um, Flint, Michigan where they finally received that title and they got to enter into the schools and interact with the students. So um, fast forward to now. So basically our biggest, our number one demand is to have all school resource officers out of schools. The reason for this was like what Jason said earlier when um, he ran around with students and asked them, you know, if they felt saved um, in their schools. And the majority of students don't feel safe around school resource officers. If we actually look at, um, what's it called? The number of school resource officers and where the majority of them are is basically in urban communities and urban public schools, which have the majority of um, minority students and students of color within those schools. And there's already a disconnect between um, people of color and police officers. There's already that disconnect there with them patrolling their communities, them um, harming people of color in their communities. So when those police officers enter the schools, it's very unsettling and can trigger some students. And it's, it's just a really bad connection there. And so basically what we're calling for is just to remove them so we can actually implement the funding into real student safety. And what that looks like is mental health counselors, um, 
I forgot what the Met is doing, um, Jason, but you can expand upon that, basically how they have like actual safety teams that go around the schools and keep it safe and there haven't been, really been any breakouts or anything. And um, hiring more people who know how to de-escalate situations because the most that can ever break out in public schools are school fights. And that that's, good, that's bound to happen, you know, they're teenagers. But learning how to de-escalate instead of having an officer walking around with a gun in the schools. So those are just some, um, what's it called? Some demands that we're really calling for to keep our students safe in public schools. So. Yeah. Um, and kind of adding on to the history of it, a lot of it also stems from in the, like the aftermath of um, uh, the tragedy at Marjorie, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, High School in Franklin, Florida, where 17 people were killed um, and at the time um, when that happened, a lot of state legislators um, and officials rushed to try and create some kind of like safety aspect or like um, some kind of measure to like keep students safe um, in terms of school shootings, um, but which in effect then furthered the criminalization of like student behavior and jeopardized healthy learning environments for students. Um, and so also an important thing to know, just a little um, fact is that the school resource offer, officer at um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas actually ran away from the scene um, when that happened and so that's just like an aspect of like delegitimizing like this is not actually like someone who's here to protect you and also someone um, who's not like you know is not actually going to protect you um, and just an example of showing like um, hey like this there are other alternatives and like this clearly is an example of where this didn't work um and so yeah and then from what i remember also like the school resource officer also didn't go in until like 12 to 11 minutes after the shooting and so that again just shows that there's not really like a, a really strong reliance on this system that they've implemented um and kind of just to go into it further, there's like no conclusive evidence that police in schools actually make schools or students any safer. Um, instead, research shows that school-based police negatively impact school climate, educational outcomes, and increase student suspensions, expulsions, and arrests. Um, and data shows that with cops, schools with cops are more likely to refer children to law enforcement, including for non-serious non violent behaviors, um, and students of color are usually targeted most. Um, and so we'll get, I'll, I can get into a little bit more about the um, student arrest data here in Providence, um, but a lot of it is for mis misorderly conduct, which um, can be very vague and almost like framed as anything. It could be like, I don't know, anything from like throwing a pencil in class or like braid braiding hair or disrupting the class. Um, and so that just shows and criminalizes like young people's behavior, but also like age appropriate behavior. like these are like young people who are exploring their identities and um, you're resorting to policing um, as a method of like trying to get them focused back into class. And so, um, yeah. Um, and uh, just a little more background, there's documentation of Providence Police um, having a presence in Providence Public Schools since 20, 2009 um, in the city's 2013 security overview. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if someone you wanna add on to anything I said. Um, there was one thing that you pointed out when you were talking about the school shootings, and it's just something very important that I would also like to point out. Um, when, and God forbid, if there is a serious school shooting, resource officers, the best that they can do is call for backup. That's the best that they can do. And on the daily, as I mentioned before, the most that can ever break out is a fight. So. This just like speaks more onto how school resource officers really are only there to intimidate the student. And like Jason said before about orderly misconduct in the classroom, as if you're like not paying attention in class, then the teacher will call the SRO on you. And then you'll have an issue with the SRO just because you're having a bad day. And it just kind of speaks to the point that like, they're just there to intimidate students. They're just there to basically push students down and have them, you know, not be able to explore themselves, not be able to come into school. Like I said, having a bad day, not really in the mood. So they don't even have the space to be open about that. So then like, it just, it basically just brings the student down. I'm sorry, brings the, brings the student down more throughout the day 
which doesn't help them focus at all in school because now if they're having trouble with their school resource officers, they have to go to the principal's office. This is a whole other topic, but like, what if they get suspended for the week? Now they're not learning anything in class. So just like basically, um, school to prison pipeline, hi. <laughs> but it basically just um, lessens their, not desire, but their will to actually want to go to school, to want to do work, to want to be in class. And so it doesn't create a safe envi environment, more so it creates a hostile environment. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's what we're trying to get rid of through counselors, not cops. Um, and so some of the organizing efforts that we've been a part of in, in doing this work, um, we first started out with um, like a sort of like a press conference um, sort of thing at the city hall back in 2018. Um, where we had students um, and allies come to City Hall and just speak on their experiences. Um, and I personally gave it, that was like one of my first time giving a speech um, about like a topic that I really cared about. Um, and we stated our demands. We also had um, Councilwoman uh, Never La Fortune who was there as well to speak on the issue as well. Um, and some of the other things we've done, we've just also had like individual conversations with um, the, uh, the uh, ed education commissioner um, Angelica Fonte Green and also the superintendent of Providence um, who uh, I think stands like I'll get into a little bit more um, and also we've had our um, Juneteenth rally which is also um, it was a method to bring awareness to the um, to the holiday of Juneteenth but also um, an effort to bring awareness to anti-blackness and um, police violence here in Providence. And so I think we had about like over 500 people in attendance for that rally. Me and Simone were part of um, planning that. Um, but we also just had folks give speeches and make demands um, in, in terms of that effort as well. And uh, we currently also have a petition um, that I'm happy to put in the link when I'm able to, in the chat when I'm able to. And also um, we have a pre-formatted um, emailing system that directly sends email to emails to the commissioner, the superintendent, um, the Providence like Human Relations Commission, um, and just folks like that, super important folks that need to like hear this work because I think that um, like I'll get into it now, but basically like in conversations that we've had with the commissioner and the superintendent, they have shown time and time again that this is just not something that they're prioritizing, nor do they care about. Um, and I think that's something as an organizer I've seen as a method of like that, like this, that's complicit, like that's extremely like you are enabling like white supremacist systems and anti-black systems as you ignore these issues. And as you like, don't listen to young people, especially young people in your district who are coming to you saying, hey, I don't want this in my school and you actively ignore them. Like, I think that like that just also replicates like systems that we see now um, in, in bigger governments. And so um, a lot of this, a lot of the work is trying to delegitimize and, and show that like, policing just doesn't work and also like you are arresting our students for things that are minor and things that are not even minor things that are just like they're experiencing through their life and learning experience um and a, a majority of these students are students of color um about like i'll get into some of the arrest data but a, a vast majority of arrests about 92 percent at Providence public schools are students of color um, black students make up 16% of the overall PPSD enrollment and almost 30% of all students, student arrests. Um, and nationally, black students are arrested at a rate three times higher than that of white students. I mean, some states they are eight times as likely. Um, and so a part of this work is, a, a huge part of this work is de deconnecting it from the school to prison pipeline, deconnecting our students from the prison industrial complex. Like once a student does get arrested, like what, like they miss school time, then it's hard for them to catch up. They may have other things that they have to do with outside of school. Then that leads them to like just miss time and miss like miss educational opportunity, which we we know like shows um, like improves graduation rates and things like that. Um, but when students are arrested and even when schools have police um, presence in them, there are like lower graduation rates, and that's just statistically proven. Um, and so, like I said, a huge part of this is deconnecting it from the school to prison pipeline. Um, our black and brown, like young people and students do not need to be police. If anything, they need more academic, mental and emotional support. Again, like time and time again, we've seen the devaluation of like black and brown young people's mental health. Um, 
a majority, like a lot of our schools only have either one mental health counselor or none at all. Some have like one nurse or not a nurse at all, or they share a nurse. And so we're asking for more nurses, more mental health resources because our schools are underfunded. And also they're putting the, something to note too, is that the money that comes from, the money that goes towards policing in Providence Public Schools does not come from the school district. It comes from the, the police um, district itself here in Providence. And so when, when we talk about defunding police, that's an aspect, right? Like they are giving money to have police in schools. And so when we're talking about defunding the police, that d then defunds police from being in schools. Um, and so that's just like a little more about like the work in general. I don't know if Simone, if you wanted to add anything. Um, Yeah, you pretty much said everything for the most part. So, yeah. Um, and I guess like I can add a couple more things too, but um, mm -hmm. this, sorry, um, the, the schools where um, police are in um, are majority black and brown schools. Um, and then we also don't see police in white schools. And so like a couple examples we have um, police, op we don't have police officers at classical high school, the Wheeler School, um, LaSalle Academy. Um, but we do have police officers at Hope High School, Mount Pleasant, Central, who have high enrollments of black and brown students. Um, and so that just goes to show that a lot of like, a lot of where they put their efforts is into black and brown people and policing it. This is very intentional work. They're doing this like on purpose, like police principals, the, the principals are the, the, the source that requests school resources, school resource officers um, to come into their schools. And a large issue um, in this work is that there's not a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of like, who are these school resource officers that are in our schools? We, there's no like database for that. There's no database for like, who is requesting them? Like we have to find those things through word of mouth. Um, like also like, where did the, where's the money coming from? Because we didn't know that for a while. Um, and so, there's a lack of transparency in this work and a lot a lack of like urgency like people like legitimately this is like a way where you're showing like I do not care about black lives or, or brown lives if you don't act on this work um, specifically to our education leadership and I think that's like something I'm realizing again and again and again as I have conversations with these people is that I can try and present as much as I would like but um, a lot of it is like having them having to do their own internalizing work of seeing like like, hey, like maybe this isn't a reliable source, um, but that's like trying to connect to their stories and trying to um, personally connect with them because if not, then they, they legitimately don't listen. Um, and so like, yeah, I like, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you made you. a point, Jason, about um, how they're not in the database. And I, when we first started, I was basically a part of the research team there was nothing to be traced. So something that we learned through that process is basically that you can apply to be um, or appoint it to be a school resource officer. However, you there's no database, so we can't even be holding folks accountable for their actions that they put towards youth. So it's kind of like if, it's, if a school resource officer, um, and they switch out too, which makes it even more complicated, but if they were to do something um, what, to a youth, to a student, then they wouldn't be held accountable because, you know, technically there's no database for us to find it. There's no statistics on them saying that they, there's nothing. There's nothing that's being provided to us. And then another point that you made was basically how the funding is coming from um, the police department. And then I, I think we all know how Gina basically put more money into the police department during Black Lives Matter protests. Um, yeah, uh, that's crazy. She put around like what two, three million dollars into the police department. So that also just gives them more money to, you know, come into our schools um, if we do or when we do reopen again and um, to have that power, that much power over us because they're they have more funding. And this is why we're trying to relocate the funding from school resource officers and put them into um, folks that our students can actually benefit from such as mental health counselors, such as nurses, because like Jason said, there's only one nurse between like central and classical, like one nurse. Um, so she's barely around. So just like putting funding into those areas where, school, where students can benefit um, from those folks instead of school resource officers. 
Um, Elena, I know the time is kind of up, but I just want to make one more important point um, is that I, I, another large aspect of this is that um, police are literally like physically harming our students. And so there's been instances where police officers are body slamming. There have been instances where um, school, resource, school resource officers in Oakland have literally murdered um, people in surrounding school parking lots. Um, and also like here in Pawtucket, there was an assault at Tolman um, High School. Um, and so there's just time and time again showing that like police violence, especially against black and brown people, um, is persistent and always and, and shows up in so many different ways. Um, and so, yeah, and also if you look at the, in terms of funding, like if you look, just like a visual representation, if you look at the um, Providence Safety Complex where um, the police reside, you can clearly see the difference between our public schools and the police department. And like the police department literally looks brand new, where in comparison to our schools, they're like, over like 50 years old have like mold broken ceiling tiles dirty water and so that just shows you like where people are putting their priorities in and investing their time and money um so yeah. thanks so much jason and simone for those comprehensive remarks thanks for leading leaving us with that image of that really really stark um juxtaposition you covered like the research that you've done the history of policing in schools um, the budgetary constraints of like what we're up against when we talk about defunding the police and some of your organizing strategies. So I think you've really opened up a fantastic conversation for us to have. And I think it's pretty clear to me how the PASS Coalition and C2C is doing great work with you two at the helm. <laughs> um, I will open it up to everybody at the end to talk about how we can all get involved with each of these efforts, but thanks for also gesturing to different petitions that we can get involved in signing, and I'll open it up to all the panelists as well. But uh, before much ado, it's my great honor to introduce our last panelist, Adeli Diaz. Adeli Diaz, she, her, is an organizer with the Alliance to Mobilize Our Resistance, AMOR, a coalition of Rhode Island-based grassroots organizations focused on providing community-based support. Originally from Rhode, uh, Los Angeles, she has been calling Providence home for over seven years, along with the rest of her Central American family. With AMOR, Arely has focused on building support networks to provide deportation relief to community members in Rhode Island and beyond, as well as other forms of support for their families. She is dedicated to building solidarity within the Northeast region against ICE, detention centers, and racist sheriffs. She hopes we can soon free them all. Welcome, Adelie. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to talk about Amor's Shutdown White campaign. Um, I will get into the history a little bit um, around the Wyatt, just because um, for folks that are not familiar with the history of that detention center, which is located in Central Falls, um, it's, it's pretty unique in that it's one of the few or maybe the only um, like, like quasi-public, they call it, which basically means that it's half private, half public, because it's run by this, um, this like nonprofit that they created, this board, um, and pri it's privately held by them. Um, but it's also like technically, you know, owned by the city of Central Falls. So there's a lot of this really weird funding um, and, and a lot of these really weird sources uh, within the, the Wyatt Detention Center, um, which makes it unique uh, within the rest of the detention centers and prisons and jails um, across this country. Um, so the Wyatt Detention Center um, is, which I mentioned is like has, has a very weird history, was uh, technically opened in, in 1993. Um, and it had this very, it had this weird uh, ownership between the city of Central Falls and this, uh, this board, um, which is why, how it's privately held. Um, it was open because a lot of the mill jobs in Central Falls had been closing down and so the city um, originally supported the opening of this detention center um, because of that, because it, it promised lo a lots of jobs coming into the city. Um, and uh, since then, uh, it was mainly used as a place where the United States Marshal Service was going to hold people um, for the Northeast region. Um, but because uh, due to a lot of 
you know, the shifting in how in policies of how people were being detained, how people were being incarcerated. Um, the Wyatt Detention Center started taking up new contracts with other agencies um, in order to fill in the gaps when people were being released and where people, um, you know, when they needed to fill more beds because there was an expansion of the Wyatt Detention Center um, after it opened. Um, and this is where, you know, the private, the private um, aspect comes in, right? When we're talking about private facilities um, that hold people, uh, we're talking about how bondholders, we're talking about how people that invest in these facilities, right, can get their money back um, and hopefully get some money out of it. So um, while the wide detention center calls itself half public because the city of Central Falls is supposed to be getting money out of it, um, it really, uh, why it's existing, why it's still open is because the people that are invested money, the companies that have invested money into it, um, are trying to get that return um, at the very least. And so in order to expand, um, it started getting contracts with different law enforcement agencies, one of them which was ICE. Um, and with ICE, um, it's had a history uh, since, since the early 2000s, um, but um, in 2008, there was the unfortunate death of one of the people being detained there by ICE, um, someone that was uh, originally from Hong Kong um, and was trying to get his, um, his green card. And uh, due, due to uh, bad, con terrible conditions inside of the Wyatt Detention Center, he died um, because they could not properly tend to cancer that you know, was happening to him. Um, and after that death, ICE decided to pull out all of his, uh, all of the people that was being detained there, and that meant the end of the ICE contract in 2008. Um, between 2008 to 2019, um, the Wyatt's still operating with the limited contracts um, between different law enforcement agencies. Um, some uh, indigenous tribes also uh, use the Wyatt to hold people there, um, and really what I, I guess started, uh, you know, put the wide detention center on the map again um, and in the news and the media was into how in 2019, um, the, the mayor of Central Falls, James Diosa, uh, held a, a public meeting, public press conference to talk about how the Wyatt had just disclosed in, in January 2019 that they had re-signed a contract with ICE. And so we're talking about 2019, right? That's three years after Trump got elected. Um, that's three years, uh, two or three years of after intense, intense policies uh, trying to end the, the crossings of people within the imaginary Southwest border. And so, um, yeah, we're talking about the zero tolerance policy, which which came out in, in that year in 2019, which basically meant that if you cross the border um, between US and Mexico at that time, you were immediately going to be prosecuted for crossing the border. And so um, that's what caused, you know, gave the Wyatt Detention Center its opportunity to gain a new contract with ICE because ICE was desperate to house people um, and get them out of these very overcrowded, terrible, um, processing centers along the border, which we saw in the, a lot of, you know, if you probably saw on the news, they call them yeleras, and they're basically where everyone that gets caught by um, border patrol down in the border ends up getting processed um, in the ways that you get processed um, in a jail, um, you know, for like getting your fingerprints and such, getting your information. Um, so 2019, we find out that Wyatt Detention Center has um, a new contract with ICE. Um, and obviously, we know that they're doing that in order to gain more, more, you know, a, a new revenue stream for themselves um, in order to pay off that those investments, right, that these companies, these bondholders had put into them um, since 1993. And so that's the that's where uh, Amor's shutdown Wyatt campaign begins. It's when we find out about this campaign, um, and you know that day of of that announcement, we did the first march, and then uh, march uh, that became like a noise dem demonstration outside of the outside of the facility. Um, and by then, we uh, folks had not when had not been transferred there yet, um, but we wanted to show our support, you know, starting from then of the folks that were being incarcerated there, um, not being detained by ICE, because we felt that it was very important for us to link, right, the, 
the two groups of people that were being held there, right? The folks that were being incarcerated um, by these different law enforcement agencies that were not ICE and the folks that were gonna be detained there eventually um, by, by ICE due to immigration, immigration violations. Um, and so um, that's, yeah, that's the origin of our campaign. Um, you know, I think just trying to talk a little bit about strategy and, and where we're, you know, what's happened since 2019 and where we're at now, um, right? Our, the main, our main call, our main demand has been for the cancellation of the ICE contract, which technically happened in 2019. Um, and I'll get a little bit into those details, but um, we're trying to get that contract ended as a means to shut down the white, right? And as a means to ensure that that facility in, in that city gets shut down completely, gets turned into something else that the community can use. And in fact, the mayor and the rest of the city council is against the white and does want it to close down as well. Um, uh, so that's really what we're after. And the reason we're, we're calling for the end of the, you know, that agreement itself is because we know that the white detention center and its board is very much dependent on that contract to to maintain that income that income stream for its bondholders and we know that because um, in early 2019 right after we found out about uh the new agreement we mobilized quick to try to um end that agreement before people were transferred right from places like texas from new mexico to rhode island um, and, and we pressured the board of the Wyatt, we pressured the city council, we pressured the mayor, right, to actually do something, not to speak on it and saying how they were against the Wyatt, but do something about it. Um, and we did, you know, targeted different actors in, in, in different ways. Um, and we actually got the board to cancel the agreement, you know, and I think it was um, an, a joint effort between, you know, like public um, mobilizing, but also like the fact that these le these public leaders in, in Central Falls were had had come out against it from the get go, um, and so the board canceled the agreement, um, and it was ordered that the warden had to um, tra re transfer out people from from the Wyatt that were being detained by ICE, um, but the bondholders, right, the people that are investing in the Wyatt, immediately sued, and had and that meant that the, the agreement had to be reinstated while that lawsuit was. Um, process and you know the whole it went through the whole criminal um punishment system so um yeah basically it's just been a lot of back and forth with litigation and trying to figure out right who is the the best actor to to pressure in this moment because currently the city has its hands tied because it's being sued by the bondholders because they move strings to cancel this contract um the board can't do anything because they are technically right supposed to answer to these investors because that is their duty as the board of the Wyatt. Um, and right, what we're left with is the folks that are incarcerated there, the folks that are detained there, um, that are, you know, that have had to live through terrible conditions, have had to live through um, an outbreak of COVID-19 inside the facility this past, this, these past few months. Um, we're left with the bondholders, right? We're left with the people that are expecting to get their money back um, from this institution. And so that's where we've been for the past few months um, and for, for re pretty much this, this whole year is trying to figure out how we can like leverage um, our power here in Rhode Island against um, Invesco, which is this very large, for people that don't know what the hell Invesco is, I certainly didn't, it's this very large company that um, is into, you know, figuring out how you can manage your investments and your money. Um, and so that's what they're in, that's their game. And obviously they have an investment in the wide and we're trying to figure out how we can really pressure this, mil, you know, this huge company, this uh, multi-million company to let go of this lawsuit um, and to stop you know, basically working to profit off people being detained and incarcerated. Um, and so that's where we've been at. Um, and, you know, we, we very much uh, look at this campaign and, and see the intersections with the, the call to defund the police um, because like, like uh, you know, folks were talking about 
defunding the police um, and, and the carceral system as a whole has many dimensions, right? We talked about, you know, police officers within cities. We talked about police officers within schools, but we also see, you know, within the Wyatt Detention Center, this other dimension of uh, where folks end up, right, getting detained, getting locked up. Um, obviously, this is a different, different fight than um, Rhode Island's main um, prison system, which is um, known as the ACI in Cranston, Rhode Island. And, you know, that's, that's definitely a fight that, that needs to be happening and is happening by, by groups in the city. Um, but that is like the biggest beast because Rhode Island, you know, doesn't have multiple jails and, and prisons with, throughout the state. It has a large complex within, within one city. Um, and so for the Wyatt, we see this opportunity, right, to really target these financial investments in order to cause a shutdown, um, in order for us to be able to prove, right, that something like this can be shut down um, and, and giving us a, a, a good win and, and to knocking out at least one piece, right, of, of policing, of law enforcement that we know doesn't function well, we know doesn't work, um, and we know it just leads to tragedies um, within it. So um, we are currently planning, right, uh, for mobilizations in, in, no in November and thinking about ways that we can continue to target and, and spotlight what happens in the white, um, because that's what it's about. It's about trying to figure out how we can gain the attention and how we can pressure these large bondholders, mainly Invesco, which is the largest bondholder of the Wyatt, um, in order to get them to, to defund, right? To get them to stop investing, to get them to stop profiting off of incarceration and detention of people. Um, and for us, you know, I think we, we see the policing of people, the policing of immigrants as the same thing. Um, immigrants are people, like ICE is police. It's all law enforcement um, and it's all fake. And we, we believe that it all has to be abolished. Um, and for us, you know, we're starting with the Wyatt, but you know, we know that the biggest fight, right, is at the ACI, is at, at Cranston. Um, and, and thinking about other ways that we can try to hold people accountable um, in the sense of community accountability, instead of having to rely on jails, prisons, detention centers, um, and policing as a whole. So um, that's everything about the campaign in a nutshell and can definitely answer more uh, if people have questions about it. Thank you so much, Areli, for really um, showing us how that case of Wyatt Corrections illustrates this nefarious public-private partnership web that we see coming up um, throughout immigrant detention and deportation in the United States right now, um, and how that's fundamentally tied to systems of, of white supremacy and policing. Um, what we're going to do now is open this up to a conversation, so I encourage those of you um, who haven't yet to include some of your questions in the Q&A box. We've started accumulating some of them and we'll get to them, but I want to just, while we have time, uh, ask everybody to go once through and just maybe say the one thing that you would love our panelists to take home and to share with people in their communities about how they can get involved. So just the one thing in this moment that you think um, could really use some community engagement. So I'll start with Vanessa. Um, wow, I was still thinking. <laughs> um, I think the one thing, I think the one thing um, would be um, for those who are wanting to get involved, I think asking yourself, what can I bring? What can I provide? What can I, what skills, whatever you want to call it, um, can I contribute to this m movement, this space? Um, but also what are ways in which I can be taking up space, right? It's important for us that as allies, right? Some of us are allies to this work. I am definitely an ally in many ways. We have to recognize when that energy is needed because we need the allies to do this work, but also when that energy is not needed because that's the part that always hurts us. Um, we saw it with the Community Safety Act. We're seeing it um, with these well-meaning, but not um, 
so-called community discussions or politicians meetings or whatever um what are ways in which as allies are you taking up space in ways that's distracting from the movement so what can you give because i love it when people are like i can provide this and i can do that because it's i'm like great cool i know exactly how to plug you in uh, but also what ways to be also be conscious of the conscious of the privileges that one holds in any space that they're moving in Jason. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I guess, yeah, I would just add on to Vanessa's point. Honestly, I think that um, chiming in however you can is extremely important. Um, but then also re like reminding yourself like where you do and don't play in and where your heart can be helpful. Cause I think that um, I spoke about this before, um, like, but um like at another panel but basically like the the concept of like respectability politics i think especially in terms of like um folks at brown because there might be a lot of folks from brown at um in this you know in this space um but like recognizing that like you are in a sense in in a, in a sense of privilege right because you you like you are somehow associated with the with the institution and Ivy League institution in a way, especially with work in Providence, um, making sure that you are emphasizing the voices that are actively organizing for this work and for folks who live here, because you know, um, you can either like be in a job and like be out for two years or be an undergrad and be here for four years and then take up space and then completely leave us like under resource. Um, and so like making sure that like when you're doing this work that it's intentional and that you're putting your best intentions into it, because this is like a lot of um, something I think people forget a lot, it's like a lot of emotional and physical labor to do this kind of work. Um, and so, yeah, just making sure that like you're, you're taking space when necessary, but also um, giving space when the organizers or people doing this work are asking for it. Um, so, yeah. Oh, sorry, one more thing. And then also like even little things like if you can give a ride to somebody to a, a, a protest or to a meeting, that's super important. Like those are things we need. If you can like provide supplies or if you're like someone who really enjoys math, help us do budget stuff, like find little ways to like intertwine yourself with the work. So yeah. Thanks. And Jason, will you also please share the link of the petition that you mentioned in the chat? Thanks. Um, Simone, what would your message be for how we can get involved? They already said it, but um, you just brought it up another way, which is basically to sign the petition. Um, stay in contact with us, stay up to date with everything that um, we're doing, what we're pushing forward. And if we do have events, um, like Jason said, where we have protests or rallies and we need allies there, and then um, we can call upon you guys basically as a base, um, then yeah, just like, you know, answer the call, read the emails, you know, just keep up to date with everything that's going on with what we're doing and um like jason said your heart has to be in the work you have to be very intentional with this because we've been fighting this for about three years already and we just got some progress started so it's going to be a while so you know just be in it for the long haul really do it because you support us um and even i'm an ally because i'm 20 i'm not a youth anymore i'm not in high school so just basically um know that you're working with youth and that you're going to be um, supporting them with their ideas and um, advocating with them, not for them. So also just recognizing that as well. Thank you. Uh, and Emily? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, just echoing a lot of what was said already, definitely. Um, and I think for us, you know, in terms of figuring out how to get the most, sometimes bodies are needed on the ground. And if you feel right, like if you're able to do that and like echoing what Jason said, if you're able to support other people in doing that, definitely like do that. Um, don't think that, you know, Oh, there'll be so many more protests to come. Like, I think we're at a very critical point right now where we do need like people on the ground when like folks that are doing the work are telling you we need people on the ground. Like, don't wait for the next one if you can make it. Um, because I feel like we're at that moment where the more people that are out there, the more people that are like, obviously, you know, being safe with how you do it, but like showing that support, showing that, you know, 
there is that broad range of, of people that will come out for, for these causes, like that's what like folks need to see. Um, we can't just keep like getting, you know, a few people like get all the heat, get all the attention, get arrested for, you know, things that like all of us could be supporting. Um, and so just, we're, I'm thinking about like, you know, mobilizing and, and demonstrations and stuff like that in, in um, particular, but um, showing up in, in ways that people are telling you to show up. Don't assume, right, that another person will do it. Take the initiative to say like, oh, I can do that um, if that's what's being called um, for, so that's what I would say. Thanks. Um, I'm going to take a question from Danny Ritchie, who specifically asked Jason about the survey that you mentioned at the very beginning when you canvassed high school youth about the different impacts of um, policing in their lives. Um, Jenny wants to know if that survey or other kinds of data that you've collected are available to the public. Um, so some of uh, that data is available um, actually on Instagram. Um, I can like paste a link really, really quickly, but also we have a um, an older petition that has some of the um, the data that um, talks about just like um, students' emotions towards um, the the policing in schools, and so I can paste that in the chat as well. Thanks so much. Um, we have two questions that I'll share in tandem because they really are asking you to or re reflecting on stuff that's happening on Brown's own campus and asking um, some of your, particularly Jason and Simone, for your input. Um, so first from Bryant Brown. Um, Bryant writes, so much respect, love, and light to all of you. I've been working with organizers thinking about disability justice, and some of them have brought up how counselors often cause harm to mentally ill and disabled students. I like how the Counselors Not Cops campaigns demand highlight the need for mental health and physical safety staff. Are there other ways you all think we can reimagine counseling that doesn't involve harming mentally ill students of color? So Jason and Simone, if <laughs> Simone wants to say something. I do. Um, restorative justice practices have been a huge part of this, um, especially with the work that I've been doing for at least two years now. Um, so, a part of Arise, one of the programs that we have during the summer is actually a program called Hidden Lotus, where we take youth that are a part of our program as well as youth outside of the programs who want to come in and join. And we basically go over, you know, how to heal our traumas, how to heal ourselves, how to heal, um, what's it called, how to deal with and like surpass mental health illness, but basically just giving that space um, where the youth can actually speak about it that's outside of you know friends that don't really listen to them or family that's not really there for them and so one form of counseling that we really do there which we do at least twice in a session is basically um, restorative justice circles where every member you know we go around in a circle basically facing each other we have a talking piece we go over like how we're feeling why we're feeling that way if we need any information to share but the entire method of the program is basically built so that we can have a, that we can give a space to um, folks who need it the most when they're battling with things such as depression or anxiety or they're battling with family issues school anything that they can be open they can speak about it so um, th those are methods that I actually, yeah, I went through another program to get certified for it, but that there is a call, you know, to um, install them within our schools, implement them within our schools. So that would be a great way to start if, um, if people do have experiences with like core counseling, because I know that that's out there as well. And every counselor is not a quality counselor. However, if they do get those um, trainings, if they do learn how to um, connect with students on a more emotional level than just like, oh, how's school? How's your grades? How's like, you know, the basics. And it's kind of like, you can't really get in touch with what's going on with the student. Um, so incorporating those practices into um, their daily counseling would probably be a lot more beneficial as well. So that's just um, one way to do it. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's super important. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that 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 conversation is super important because also like over like fifty percent of people who like have interactions with the police or are, are killed by the police are disabled people. Um, and I think disability justice gets forgotten a lot in, in this work. Um, but it's also very real to acknowledge that like a lot of students can also have um, like trauma from the social work like system and also um, just like not also just not want to talk to somebody in, in the ways that like they're provided. And so um, I think that's an aspect where it's really important for like student teacher relationships to be prioritized um, and making sure that um, even if it's just someone to like check in and ask like, what do you need today? Like that, that teacher can be that person um, to facilitate that conversation. So that way it doesn't have to be somebody else. It's someone that they're already interacting with. And it's not like, oh, here's like a special person that you can like talk to. Um, it's someone that's like already there for them. And so I think um, one that providing teachers with that training, but then also, um, yeah, establishing that relationship and making them stronger, um, which we can't do because also like specifically in Providence is harder because they are prioritizing police relationships with students. And so, um, yeah, so that's like, how that work kind of intertwines so yeah thank you um i think a clarification question that would be probably fairly quick for Adeli to ask um, from anonymous attendee i also believe the mayor of central falls brought wyatt to court because they're not paying the city any payments what's the update on that court case um I do not know the status of that court case, but to my knowledge, that was the city counter suing to the lawsuit that had been brought against them. Um, and so far, all of that has been pending. Um, due to COVID-19, a lot of things has, a lot of those court cases have been stalled. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for the question. Uh, Vanessa, a question for you. Do you think, from Elton Barbosa, do you think that the red Democrats are a problem because they say they're Democrats but have very conservative views? And I want to like broaden this up um, just in light of the very bipartisan climate that we have right now with like presidential debates looming in the background. Where does like bipartisanship sit in your mind with like efforts to defund the police? Yeah, um, it's actually really funny because it's in Providence when I learned just because you're a Democrat, that doesn't mean anything. Um, because I was really surprised by how conservative some of the Democrats uh, are, where you have Democrats who are um, pro-life and all lives matter. And it's like, are you really a Democrat? But then at the same time, I also recognize that this bipartisan political system wasn't designed for people like me. It wasn't designed for black and brown, queer and trans, youth, um, undocumented folks, immigrant folks. Like I don't have faith in this bipartisan political climate because I know at the end of the day, it's not actually about communities that are being affected by these issues. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat. For me, this, this political, I, I, I don't like political organizing. That's why I work with community members in to find different ways that are outside of politics that can can exist without uh, these systems in place that were not built for us. So we'll see. I just all I know is that whether whether whoever is in these offices, whoever holds these powers, hold power. That's not to the community. So for me, that's just not computing. <laughs> Thanks. Um... And then a question from Jeffrey Feldman, which again reorients this as a Brown University event. Many of us watching are affiliated with Brown. Brown University's public safety officers are armed officers of the state of Rhode Island. How does the university affect your struggle? And what can the university community do to support your work? And I want to bring up this up in tandem with um, an incredible coalition of graduate students and allies called Grasping at the Root that Bryant has listed in the Q&A. It has an incredible list of demands, including along the lines of um, defunding, centrally defunding the police on Brown's campus. But Jason and Simone, any ways that we can work together? I feel like definitely we can always like exchange organizing strategies um, and just like 
you know, have conversations. I think also like that's super important and something I've been thinking about too is like policing, how policing at uh, universities and colleges affects the local community. Cause um, like just, it's not, it's not even like database or statistical based, but like a lot of Providence students go to like Thayer Street or are around downtown. Um, and so like, what does it mean for them to see um, like Brown's like police officers? Cause I personally know that like, I'm also like intimidated, like my police, all like all police officers um, in the sense where it's like, yes, I'm a, I'm a black person. So like completely makes sense. But um, I just know that like as a young person where it's like, this is my city. And like, you're also like in a place where it's like this prestigious institution. And like, you get to like, I don't know, you get to be in my city and like almost put and also patrol me in a way and it's like um which I personally just don't I don't like at all and don't support um but that's just something I've been thinking about like our our youth also have interactions with police who are who are funded by universities and and colleges and so um I think that's super important work to like divest and um defund in a lot of ways so yeah um that brought up an interesting, not interesting, but very important fact. Um, so basically the high school that I've been at, I was there since I was seven, so K through 12. Um, but it's a chartered school, so we didn't have any SROs. We have the occasional officer who started coming around like four years ago um, that started coming around school, but I didn't grow up with SROs around. I did grow up with police around, never, so there's that disconnect there. But I connect this to me going to different high schools and then having to experience SROs within those schools when I was visiting or when I was helping um, facilitate a class or something I was there for. And I was just, I'm sorry. But then even as a person who got mistaken as a student, I was mistreated very much so by SROs. So if there are SROs within the schools or if they are patrolling around, um, what's it called, around the area, then it also affects people within the community who may not necessarily be attending there. So there are also um, pretty high stakes with that one. And because you guys are at Brown University, I know that Hope High School is very close to um, Brown and Bayer, and that's one of the schools where there is heavy policing as well. So. That, imp that impacts it heavily as well because now you have double the police officers around, which is completely unnecessary. But like Jason said, we can definitely work together and share um, organizing tactics around that. Thanks so much. Um, another question from Danny Ritchie, which mentions specifically two campaigns, but I'll open it up to this larger question of what are these important leverage points that each of your campaigns see right now. So from Danny, um, so many more questions. I am on the mayor's African-American ambassador groups police subgroup. I was involved with the 2015 state legislation Vanessa discussed and peripherally the CSA. Neither have been effective in decreasing police brutality and abuse now aware that it probably had to do with the police bill of rights. So there are many more nuances that obstruct accountability. We are also working on the SRO question. So wondering how to coordinate to put more pressure on the superintendent. Could you each talk about what you think are important pressure points right now? Um, I think it's just like, it's like, it's a difficult conversation because I, I've had conversations with the superintendent and he's very passive about it, very like, um, like, yeah, I'm, I'm looking into it. There will be like different answers floating around, like, yes, I'm for the removal of school resource officers. No, I'm not for it. Um, and so I would say like, it's really, I don't know. It's like really trying to to make these folks understand that these are like real lives at folk at, at stake. Um, and like also, um, that like a lot of people are tired, like other cities have implemented this already. Um, it's an example, like literally in so many other places, it's worked well in so many other places where school, uh, school resource officers have been removed and replaced um, with, with other services. And so it's, it's, I think it's really exemplifying like, hey, like this works and also um, collaborating with, with organizers who are doing this work and who are the experts in this work to present the information over and over again. Cause I think that it, it's just sort of at the point where it's like, um, like, why aren't you listening at this point? It's kind of like, it's really complicit. Um, and so 
um i think it's it's a, definitely time for more direct action <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I want to add to that, to what Jason said, um, because it is, it is frustrating to um, ask so nicely so many times, because we have been very nice, right? Um, we, we have tried to do it the quote unquote right way, the polite way, the, the way that is deemed acceptable, right? We got the petitions, we will design the cute website and all that stuff to appeal to these politicians who um, will only respond to things in a certain way, right? We have to kind of pander to them. And that sucks. And I'm kind of, you know, it's like, there are so many things that the mayor himself can do about this, right? He is the boss of the Providence Police Department. If he says someone should be fired for assaulting a community member who's been handcuffed, he has the power to fire that person. And so it's, it's been very frustrating because we see these committees that are established, we see these like, um, you know, uh, like memos and whatnot that are written and, and to study and to collect that data and stuff like that. And it's like, but we're telling you that we're not safe. We're telling you that we it's are- like we've already done that work. <laughs> we yeah. like, we've been doing that work. We've been gathering these stories and yet they continue to be ignored over and over and over again until you get a fancy report from some institution that has historically done harm to communities of color specifically. And then it's legitimate, right? And then it's legitimate when you have these facts and these data and these figures. And so it's frustrating to have these elected officials and these, these politicians and these figureheads because we're doing it the nice way, we're doing it the way that you wanted, you're still not listening to us. So then when we react with anger and frustration and just overall tiredness, because I'm tired of this, it's like, oh, well, well, where's this coming from? You know. So I think putting more pressure on these politicians, yeah, sure, let's do that. But, us, but more importantly, how are we ensuring that our community is 100% behind this, right? Because Focusing on these politicians can sometimes be a little too distracting. And I think we need to remember at the core of what this is, is empowering our community members and empowering especially our youth to speak up and take back their power. There's another thing that goes on to that because I can't even talk about how like the past three years, how many discussions we had with city council members, with um, PTSD, with um, ride and how many times they just don't listen to us at all and i think it's because like i don't know if it's because youth are speaking on it or if it's because they just want to be completely you know laissez-faire hands off with everything um but we we tried we tried every route like vanessa said politely um doing it the right way scheduling meetings with them even through um covid we were scheduling meetings with Ride that just like fell through. It's it's been a mess um, working with these folks and trying to have us listen. Then the John Hopkins report came out, like Vanessa said, and that's when they started listening, but at the same time, barely listening. And then there's one meeting that we had with PTSD that I remember, where it's kind of like I don't know if this was their way of rebuttaling, but they had SROs come to a meeting and basically talk to the community about how good they were and all the good that they're doing in the schools. And there was a mention of how we need community members like 110% on our side, otherwise we can't do this work. And I remember that there was a lady who knew my family, she knew my dad, my aunties, all that. And she was talking to me about like how good cops are and how good SROs are. And so you just had a lot of people who were there who were like heavy on the, we need to keep cops in schools to keep students safe. You know, and so it's kind of like trying to not only persuade um, the superintendent, um, the mayor, right, city councilman, but also to persuade like our own community to be 110% with us. That's something that we need to figure out how to move forward with and that we need your help with as well to like expand upon those ideas because it has been, it has been a struggle. We do need to push back like 
very hard on those um the folks in power but as well as the folks in our community because there is a lot of you know what's it called oblivious being oblivious <laughs> and it's, it's just something that we need to work on as a community as well and Ellie has shared in the chat that only the panelists can see. We should just go occupy the PPSD building. So I hope we can do that and you can call on all the attendees to do so. Um, related to this question of like getting people to believe us uh, and the importance of data, as you all have mentioned, uh, one last question from Anthony Sturase. Thank you all so much for this. I've been having a hard time finding publicly available data on policing in Rhode Island. How have you all worked around this? In conversations with policymakers and academics, I've gotten resistance because I don't have exhaustive data to present. Um, uh, I will say that, oh, go ahead, Jason. No, you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, yeah, a lot of there isn't a lot of like public data. I will say that like over in policing overall, like budgeting is very hard to find. All that kind of stuff is super hard. Um, and a lot of the data we do is like our own data majority of the times. Like we'll we'll make our own surveys and we'll make our own um, our own like I don't know formats to like try and get answers and stuff like that. Um, and I think a lot of it too is like pressuring and then building uh, relationships with folks and making sure that like they trust you with the information um to like be able to get it um because i think that they just don't realistically i think some folks don't want to give out data because it shows um discrepancies and, and realities where it's like yeah this isn't equitable and i don't want people to see this statistically or or um in in data um so yeah vanessa final thoughts yeah i was gonna say uh me too it's also hard for me to get data uh, and that's actually very intentional. It's very hard to file um, Freedom of Information Act request or um, APRAs, what does it stand for? Uh, Access Public Records Act? Access to Public Records Act, whatever. Um, it's hard to get information when you're filing those requests and that's intentional, that's purposeful. Um, we have had a very hard time getting data like as an organization and we've been doing this for years and so um, I can definitely talk more about data because it's fascinating. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, on behalf of my fantastic colleagues at the CSSJ, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today and sharing your incredible expertise. Thank you to the attendees for joining us. For those of you who registered, the recording of this webinar will be available in about a week and we'll email you. For those of you who haven't signed up or who haven't, aren't on our mailing list, please be sure and join. The this, America, this Is America series will last throughout the year and we're gonna cover some really pertinent events um, in future episodes. So things like voter suppression, um, monuments, race and education, reckoning with police violence. Um, so you can find more information about that and our other programs on our website. And on that note, I'm signing off and thanking everybody with... I'm down.